All right. Just to make sure that we've covered looping appropriately, I don't want to do the entire chapter in one day, which is what it kind of looks like we did. We're going to go back and look at for loops and pretest and post test and the break statement and the continue statement. And then we can hit chapter seven after that. So the for loop got a really nice syntax. The reason it's a nice syntax is if you use a while loop, you have to initialize the variable, the loop control variable on one line, and then you have a while with a test on another line, and then after the body you have an update. So you have three things in a while loop, whereas a for loop, all three things of those are declared right in the header. It's much easier to write just because you look at it and you understand it in a single glance what it's about to do. So this for loop would count from 10, excuse me, from 2 to 10, adding 1 to it each time. I know that because I see a 2, 10, 2 there, any less than or equal to 10 there, and a plus plus there. So I know it's going to count 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's go and make a new project, which I've already done. So if you're watching at home, pause the recording, catch up. I can't find the lecture J files, which I'm pretty sure are supposed to be there, but I'm going to call this one K anyways to match the other class. I'm going to make it .c rather than .cpp because this is a C file, not a C++ file, although it works if you call it .cpp just because C++ is by and large backwards compatible. And the good old boilerplate, I'm going to nab that. It would have been nice when I wrote these pragmas if I'd made comment of what the errors were, because otherwise they're pretty mysterious. Kind of like voodoo programming or cargo cult programming is what it's called when you do something and you don't know why you're doing it, you're just doing it. So let's see if we can figure out what warning 4996 is. Compiler warning. Oh, there could be a whole bunch of them. How nice. Well, it's talking about deprecated functions. We might want to stop using scanf and instead use fgets to get our input. And the reason for that is that scanf is not the safest operation because a user can type in too much if they're filling in a string variable they can type in more than the buffer would contain. That's actually worth talking about. Let's declare a string buffer called name. <coughs> care name, or we can call it SZ for zero terminated name. If you want to get all techy like that, SZ name, and we're going to say that your name had better not be more than 20 characters long. Now we're going to print a message telling them to enter a name. Print F, enter your name greater than end quote semicolon close parentheses semicolon now let's read it in scan f parentheses quote percent s end quote comma now we have been using ampersand but if it's a string you actually don't have to it's kind of an exception but oddly enough I think it works if you do put it let's test it both ways but strictly syntactically speaking it's you shouldn't have to actually put the ampersand there for reasons that we'll talk about when we get to arrays. I know we talked about pointers. That would add a pointer to it. I mean, make a pointer to it, which is usually what you need for scanf. But let's leave it off and see what happens. And now let's print out what it is. Print out parentheses, quote, your name is percent %s. Let's put single quotes around it. Your name is single quote percent s another single quote or apostrophe backslash n end quote comma s z name and let's run it and let's type in some good data 
By good data, I mean not more than 20 characters long, and it actually had better not be more than 19 characters long, for reasons I'll explain in just a minute. Enter your name. Bob. Your name is Bob. All well and good. The problem comes if the data that I'm entering is longer than this number, including a terminating null. So if this is 20, the longest number of characters I can add in is 19. If this is 10, the longest number of characters I can add in is 9. I'm going to keep shrinking this until it's real easy to overload it. If it's 5, the longest number of characters I can type in is 4. So I can type in Fred. That'll work, but David will not. Or it'll look like it works, but it's unsafe. It's writing past the end of a buffer. So Fred should work. When I run it again and I type in David, it'll probably work, but it may pop up a warning saying that memory has been corrupted. There it goes. Runtime check failure number two. The stack around the variable SZ name was corrupted. So we broke it. We broke the program by typing in too much data. You can use fgets instead. fgets allows you to specify the number of characters you're going to read. Even if you do scanf underscore s. So a scape version of Sankana. Yeah, you ought to be able to do that as well. I need a quick reminder of the parameters that are allowed here. And then I may need to Google as to why you would want to use fgets rather than scanf safe. Reads formatted data. They have security enhancements where you specify the number of characters you're going to read. The size parameter is of type unsigned. So we can specify how many characters we want to read. And they're using underscore count of, which is clever because I don't think that, that I knew about that function until I just saw it there. It looks like a Microsoft extension. The reason I say that is because it's got an underscore in front of it. But yeah, scanf ought, s scanf should work, or scanf underscore s. Not convinced. I just want an example of a game. Size of. Size of name. All right, that'll work. So if we come up here and do s scanf underscore s percent s comma sc name comma size of parentheses sc name in parentheses, we'll see if it's safer. We'll see what happens if we type in. I need to stop the debugging, so I'm going to click the red square. All right, enter your name. Let's first test it to make sure it works. Now let's test it again. For too much David uh, data, David, your name is. Well, at least it didn't blow up, right? I'm not sure if that's what I would consider the best behavior. Scanf will be returning a value, which I am curious about. Int r for return value equals scanf. We're going to check to see what it returns under an error condition and under a success condition. Printf r equals percent d backslash n end quote comma r just to see what it returns upon a success and what it returns on a failure. All right, enter your name. Fred, success, return code of one. Run it again. David, return code of zero. So it did fail, and it told us that it failed. We could check the return code to make sure that we got some data, and if the uh, return code was zero, it meant that we did not. All right, I'm going to do a quick Google to see why I had notes that said use fgets instead.
f get s versus scanf underscore s. f gets is in most cases used to read a given line of data where scanf is used for the dissection of the data. Another thing that comes up is the difference that scanf does not perform bounds checking, well we know that, while f gets provides a better choice that can allow for evaluation to be done. I want to know what the difference between f gets is and scanf. Well, we know what the difference is between f gets and scanf. Scanf doesn't do any bounds checking. Anyways, many people will use f gets to read the line of data and then use scanf as scanf to dissect it. f gets can read from any open file, whereas scanf reads standard input. Now, that is actually a valid concern. Because once we start reading from files, it's nice to already have programmed into our brain the uh, function that reads from the file. Because we can use that function to read from the uh, keyboard, and we can use that function to read from the file. Well, let's change it to fgets. fgets requires you to specify the destination and the number of bytes and the file stream. Well, we don't have a file stream, but we can specify standard in as our file stream. fgets standard in. The syntax looks like this. How to read from stdin with fgets. stdin. Well, let's write it anyways and then blow it off and never talk about it again. How about that? Okay. So, what I'm going to do is tell them to enter the name again. I could just copy that line. Enter name again. Space, colon, greater than, in quotes, semicolon. Now let's get the data. SZ name equals F gets parentheses. No, wait, that's not how you do it. It does return a pointer to a string, though. But let's not bother with that. F gets parentheses, and then the buffer name, SZ name, comma, the number of characters we want, which is 5, or size of SZ name, in parentheses, comma, and we want to read from SDDIN, from standard input. And again, let's write out our name once we get that output. So I'm just going to copy and paste that line and paste it. Okay. So let's make sure it works for good pieces of data both times. Enter your name, Fred. <coughs> Enter your name again. Okay, the second time it just zipped right on past it. It didn't even let me enter the second name. That is of concern. What it did is it counted our carriage return as part of the name. We run it again. I'm just going to type in Bob and see if it behaves differently. Well, why do you know? It keeps doing that. That's that's not too cool. I might blow off the discussion of fgets. How about if we had used scanf underscore s again. I'm going to just comment out that f gets because I didn't like what it did. I don't understand my notes anymore about that. I'm going to highlight all that. Scanf underscore s. Just copy that. Paste it. Run it. Enter your name. Fred. Enter your name again. Fred. Okay, that seems to work. What happens if I botch it? Enter your name. David. Enter your name again, Fred. All right. Seems to be working the way that we would expect it. So, you should not be using plain, plain F scanf. Instead, use the safe version, scanf underscore s where you specify the length of the buffer.
the array you are reading into. You don't have to do that if you're not reading in, if you're not reading a string, if you're not reading into a character array. So why did I say that had to be five if we wanted to store four letters? Because if it looked like this, in an array, the first element is element number zero. The second element is index one. The third element is index two. The fourth element is index three. And if this was four, then there wouldn't be any room for the invisible null character, which tells it to terminate the string there because 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but if it's declared out to four spaces, we could only have 0, 1, 2, and 3. There wouldn't be any room for that null character, and every string needs to be terminated with a null character. Now, we don't know about the null character. I mean, we don't worry about it. It gets filled in automatically for us, but the computer has to know what the, marks the end of the string, and so it sticks a ASCII 0 at the end of it. Not the number 0, but an ASCII, you know, null value. If we went to ASCII table and looked up, you know, what character zero was or what the null value was, it would say that it was the, num the byte named zero. Okay, so there's our example of that. I'm just going to copy and paste that scanf statement into my notes like that. Now I'm going to prove that it would have worked if we had used an ampersand there which would be our urge, right? Because we've used ampersand on every other scanf. Fred, Fred. Oh, the second time it did not work. What have I done? You're saying, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't have filled this in. Is that what I changed? I made this four characters and so it's one and three. That's actually what the case is, is I made this too small. And then I tried to type in Fred, and so it went past the end of the array. Okay, now that I've changed it back to five, I should be able to type in Fred the first time, Fred the second time, and it worked both times. It's surprising that it works with or without the ampersand, right? Because usually programming languages have such particular syntax. But this is an array, and an array and a pointer look exactly the same to the computer because an array just points to the first piece of data right it points to the Fred if this was equal to Fred F-E-R-D so they can be used interchangeably and putting a pointer in front of the array is technically not really all that good of an idea it shouldn't work but it does it is correct to take it off I'm gonna add a comment to that effect if using scan F to read into a character array which we will call a string. Don't use the ampersand like we normally do. I'm wondering if that's a Microsoft specific variant. Don't use the ampersand like we normally do. Although oddly, this seems to work with it. This is because an array reference and a pointer reference are the same thing. And what does that mean? Let's show a pointer. Did I do this on, on Wednesday? Did I show pointers? Feel free to go, what? And shake your head, no. no. All right, okay. So pointer is like if I hand you a piece of mail, you have that mail. You can do whatever you want to to it. But if I tell you the address of my mailbox and you go to my mailbox, then you can do that. The pointer is the address of the mailbox. In other words, it's the address to what memory the variable is storing its data in. And so if you do this, int value equals 1, 2, 3. We have a value named 1, 2, 3. Excuse me, a variable named value it's of type int and it's containing the value 1, 2, 3. That means that somewhere, pop open notepad, feel free to not, utter, absolutely not type this. That somewhere out in memory, like I said, I wouldn't type these. 
we have a series of bytes, right? And a byte is four, excuse me, we have, yeah, we have clusters of four bytes. I'd label them in four byte increments because each int occupies four bytes. We talked about an integer being a four byte data type. So when we said int value equals one, two, three, the computer went and it stored a one, two, three out in that memory address in the next several bytes. And so this is at address 1000. And then if we go and we create another variable and we store 567 in it, it's going to be at another address, 567. So it pops up here, 567, right there. So anytime we want to do anything, like if we want to print f percent d comma value, what that's telling the computer to do is to, oh, what memory address are you holding? Why, I'm holding a thousand. Okay, I'm going to go to that memory address. I'm going to pull the value out that's stored at that memory address and then print it out. And so it'll print out one, two, three. Normally, we don't know the memory address, but we can tell C to tell us. Now, if you're using Python or Java, there's no way to get the memory address out, but there is in this language. Let's play with that idea. Let's print out the value. And then let's print out the memory address. So printf, parentheses, quote, data equals percent %d, comma, address equals percent, and I'm going to use x here because I want to see it in hexadecimal format. I'd like to see a's and b's and c's and d's and e's and f's. We could just do another percent %d, though, but I'm going to go ahead and use percent %x backslash n, end quote, and I'm going to print out the value, and then I'm going to print out the address of it, which we indicate with the ampersand, ampersand value. Let's run it and find out what it does. We still have our system pause at the bottom. Good. It's going to ask for data every time. I'm going to get real tired of that and maybe comment it out. Bob, Bob. All righty. And so our data is 123, but the address that that variable is stored in is byte number 113F71C, you know, 1 million into the computer, you know, or at least 100,000, however many digits that is. Looks like a, a million, right? So a megabyte, you know, whatever. Right, it has these numbers stored in it. If we create another variable, like int value two, I'm just going to copy these guys, and paste them, and change the value to value two. Bob, Bob. All right, and we see here that they're stored in different addresses. Let me zoom in. Let me make the font bigger. So, this variable, value, is stored at this memory address. This variable is actually stored at a different address. I mean, it should be, right? Because they're holding different pieces of data. I made that one say one, two, three as well, but I didn't mean to. They shouldn't contain the same value. That doesn't prove anything. So I'm going to make that eight, seven, six, or something other than one, two, three. Bob, Bob. All righty. Notice the address keeps changing, right? That's because we have no control over what byte the computer chooses to store its data in. And we shouldn't have any control. The operating system is randomizing it so that each time it runs, it loads into a different memory address. And the reason it does that is for security purposes, so that you can't depend upon any program loading in the same space every time. What's kind of weird is that the second variable actually shows up in an earlier memory address. So my example here, where I had value in V2, It's like value was actually created here and V2 was created here, but that doesn't really matter. 
The point is, is that every variable has both a memory address that it's pointing to and the value that that address is at. That's like if I wanted you to go and tell me what mail was waiting for me, I would give you my house address, my apartment address and number, right? And you could drive out there and you could open it and you could say, oh, by the way, you had a one, two, three in your mailbox. And then you have a different address. And so you might tell me to go and check your mailbox and you give me your home address and your apartment number. And I run out there and I tell you that you had a five, six, seven stored in it. So that's what a pointer is. It's a memory address. You can store this ampersand value, this address, in a separate variable. But you have to declare it special, like this, int p value. Except you got to put a star in front of it, star in front of it, to indicate that it's a pointer. And I put a p in front of it because that's just programmer tradition. It's that you have a pointer, you begin the variable name with a p. Just like it's programmer tradition that if you have an array, a string array like that, you call it S name or S Z name, zero terminated string. Okay. I'm going to make a second one too because we have two variables going on. Int star P value two, right? And they were at different addresses. So P value equals ampersand, give me the address of value. And p value 2 equals ampersand value 2. Now I can print those out. And if I print those out, we're going to find out that it was the same values as we saw up here. Right? So print f percent x space percent x, end quote. I'm using percent x to print out the memory address. It'll print it in hexadecimal format. We could probably force it to be in some other format. If I just printed it in D, we'd see, you know, a decimal format. But traditionally, addresses are displayed in hexadecimal for some reason. Okay, so I'm going to print out the p value of p value and then the value of p value 2. Notice that up here, when I was printing out their addresses, I was using the ampersand, saying, give me the address. But now we have those addresses, and we stored them in these pointers. So now that I'm printing out the values of those pointers, I don't need to use the ampersand anymore because I don't want a pointer to a pointer. Yeah, that's sometimes useful, but not in this case. Bob. Bob. All right. And see, we see here that these addresses match the addresses that we got up here. So that first pointer, p value, contains this address. And that second pointer, P value 2 contains that address, and we can use that to actually change the data. Like this. Star P value 2, and it's okay if you don't totally get this. Don't, don't fret and freak out about it. Star P value 2 is equal to 9876. Something like that. Now I'm going to print out value 2. Notice that no line of code in here changed value 2. Never did I have value 2 equals anything other than 876. But if I print it out, I'm going to find out that it did change. Printf value 2 now equals percent %d backslash n end quote comma value 2. And like I said, there was no line, whoops, get rid of that semicolon outside the parentheses, put it inside. There is no line of code here that changes value to. Not a one. But we did change the value that the pointer is changing to 9876. That's like you driving out to my mailbox and then putting something in it, putting 9876 into my address. And so it's actually going to change the value of that variable. It's still going to be at the same address, but it's going to have a new value. If I copied and pasted that, right, I'm not going to do that. But you know, anyways, value 2 will now be different than it was. Value 2 at one time was 876. And then after that statement where we changed it by its pointer, where we changed it by its address, it's now 9876. And that is incredibly important. Because if you're going to write a function that needs to change data, that's just about the only way to do it, unless you're just going to return the new value.
I'm going to leave that thought dangling though because I'm eager to get back to loops. Are we good or do we need typo correction, guys? Pardon me? Okay. All right. So a loop. This loop counts from 2 to 10 by 1s using a for loop. May as well do that. For parentheses int count equals 1 semicolon count less than equal to 12 semicolon count plus plus close parentheses open angle printf open parentheses quote percent d or how about count equals percent d and then a backslash in before that end quote after that end quote we want the count variable and then close parentheses close semicolon and it's going to print out the numbers between 1 and 12 getting real tired of typing in Bob I'm going to go and comment that stuff out so up here where we're talking about enter your name and name to and all that business I'm just going to comment all that out or maybe I'll if def it out pound sign if def as name example pound sign if def name example do all that stuff pound sign in diff at the very bottom of that now it is if def out and if I want to see it I can define name example like this pound sign define name example now it'll work just the way it did before it's still going to ask me for a name Bob Bob that's great but if I but if I comment this out name example is no longer defined and so the preprocessor is going to leave all of this out that one no longer ask me for the name and the name again. Good. Saves me some time. You can use if def to mark out things of code. Or you could use com comments, right? We're already familiar with this idea, right? We could put a slash star in front of it, then it's kind of arguing with me about it, and then uh, write a star slash at the end, and now it's all green text. I could do that, but I'm going to stick with using if def. I just want you all to see that. That's a common technique for removing a block of code. And you can put it back in just by defining that preprocessor variable. So I could backspace that, and all of a sudden it would start asking my name again. All right. Now that it's if def out, I can run it, and I will see that the counter does indeed go from 1 to 12. Let's count backwards. Let's count back from 12 to 1. For parentheses, int count equals 12, semicolon. Count, keep going as long as count is greater than or equal to 1. Not less than. Right, we're going backwards, so we have to check greater than. And then count minus minus. And we just need to print it out again. Count, print. F parentheses quote count backwards equals percent D backslash in end quote comma count in parentheses and now it's going to count forward to 1 to 12 and then it's going to count backwards 12 to 1 all right 1 to 12, 12 to 1. And I hope we know how to write a while loop that does the same thing. There's no loop you can write with a for loop that you can't write with a while loop. You just have to remember to do your three steps. Your three steps are initialize, and then write a test, and then inside, the, after the body is done, you have to update the loop control variable. That's if you're going to do a while. So let's write this loop again with a while. I want a different variable other than count. I don't know what variable it's going to be. But let's initialize it. Int, I don't know, just C. 
is equal, let's count from 100 to 120. So int c is equal to 100, while parentheses c is less than or equal to 120, in parentheses. Let's print it out. Print f parentheses quote percent d backslash n end quote comma c in parentheses semicolon and I just about left out the update and if I had it'd be an infinite loop like that alright so that's because I left off the third state and if I left off the third one and we never updated the variable then it's gonna stay less than 120 forever we don't want that so we need to update C update the counter and it did count from 100 to 120 and we could have written that as a for loop with one line of code rather than all three of these steps because you have the initialize, the while test, and the update right? for loop lets you do it all in one right? for c equals 100 semicolon c less than or equal to 120 semicolon c plus plus and since there's only one line of code rather than a block I don't even necessarily need the curly braces I'm going to put them there, but you don't need them if your block is only one line. Print f parentheses quote percent d backslash n end quote comma c in parentheses semicolon. And it did it. It counted from 100 to 120. Two times because of the for loop and the while loop. Matter of fact, I'm going to stick the word while here just to distinguish it and the word for here. So, you have two ways of writing pretest loops. Why is it called pretest? Because the loop happens at the top of the body. And if this test is not true, then it won't even go in and print anything at all. Right? If I change this to 1000, 1000 is not less than 120, and so we're not going to see anything inside of while. So I'm going to change that and I'm not going to see the word while at all. Right? All I see is my fours. It's a pretest loop. This wasn't true. It's just like if this was an if statement. If this is false, it doesn't come in here. I'm going to change it back to 100 now. How to use a break statement? Oh, oh, if you get an infinite loop because you didn't do that, very good question. You run it. Since we're in debugging mode, we might be able to come over here and click the stop debugging red square. That ought to do it. Or, yeah, just find the close box, and that ought to do it, too. Either way. Okay. A post-test loop is when the while is after the body rather than before, like this. C is equal to 100, and then do some stuff. Do, open curly, print F, parentheses, quote, do, space, percent D, just to distinguish it from the other two loops, backslash N, end quote, comma, C, in parentheses, semicolon. And again, we have to update it because we're not writing a for loop where the update happens automatically. So I have to do C++ there just like before. And then after the curly braces, rather than before, as in the pretest loop, we add the while condition. While, parentheses, C. Let's only count. Tell you what, 100 is boring. Let's go from 1 to 10. C is equal to 1 and keep going while C is less than or equal to 10 just to visually distinguish it on our screen because we're getting these big old long series of numbers. And I left, I made an infinite loop. I think I forgot, yeah, forgot to uncomment that change I made. All right. And so it printed while up to 120, for up to 120, and do, you know, 1 to 10. 
And that's great and all that. Well, how's that any different than the while loop? You could have written that as a while loop. It is the same unless we change this to an invalid value, right? If C is equal to 100, it's going to slip in here and print it out even though we wanted to only print C as long as it was less than 10. And it did. It printed 100. It didn't print anything else, but it's like the if statements at the bottom. So C is equal to 100 and then do some stuff. Print it out. It printed 100. And then it added 1 to C, so C became 101. Well, C is less than or equal to 10. Is 101 less than or equal to 10? No, it's not. So it fell out of the loop at that point. So this is an example of a post-test loop. do loop equals post test because the test follows the body rather than precedes it. So the big functional difference is that if you use a while loop, the loop might get skipped altogether if the condition is false. If you use a do loop, then it's always going to go into the body at least once, regardless of whether this terminating post test is true or false. So we'll write that down. The difference between a post test loop, do loop, and a pre test loop, while, is that if the test condition is false, the body of the while loop won't be entered at all. But the body of the do loop will always be run at least once because the test post test follows the body rather than precedes it. A lot of typing there. I just think my explanation is better than the book, so I felt like typing a lot. So, in general, rules, guidelines. If you need the body, to happen at least once, use a do loop. If you need a counter, use a for loop. If you need an indefinite loop that doesn't match rule one, I guess we could just say otherwise. Otherwise, use a while loop. Now, honestly, there's nothing you can write with a for loop or a do loop that you can't write with a while loop, which is why Python doesn't even have a do loop, because you can get away without it. It just makes for nice syntax. It makes it easier to write. Okay, we need to talk about continue versus break. We did talk about the case and the switch, right? We know what case and switch mean. Well, the break does the same thing inside a loop. For parentheses, int value equals zero, values less than or equal to 10, semicolon, value plus plus. Let's print that value out. Print F, parentheses, quote, value equals percent D, backslash N, end quote, comma, value. But now we're going to do a little test. We just absolutely hate the number seven. So if parentheses, value equals equals 7 in parentheses, break. What we're saying is that once this case is true, we're done with the loop, no matter what else, no matter what this says, we're kicking ourselves out right now. Now normally you wouldn't do that. Right in the middle of a for loop, do a break for some arbitrary reason like that? No, this is just an example. And so we will see value count up from 0 to 7 and then stop. like that because it broke. It braked out of the loop. It broke out of the loop. 
Now continue does something else. What continue does is it causes it to jump back to the top of the loop rather than bail out and go to the bottom of the loop and leave. So if value equals equals 5 in parentheses continue. What does that mean? No, I'm going to stick that beforehand. I'm going to cut that and paste it before the printf. Otherwise, we're not going to see what it does. All right, so there's my code. If value equals 5, continue, then print it, and if value is equal to 7, break. So what's going to happen? As value increments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 is a special case because of that if statement. And if that is true, then it continues, which means immediately increment and jump to the top. Don't do anything else. And so it skips all this. So it's not going to print out that the value is 5. It just skips it all. Continue means go back to top. Break means exit the loop. Just like it meant exit the switch. So now when we run it, we're going to see it count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But when it hits 5, it's going to continue rather than print it. So we're not going to see it print 5. Then it's going to print 6. Then it's going to print 7. But when value is equal to 7, it's going to break out of the loop early. like that. So what do you really use break for? Quite often you use break like if you hit some terminating error condition. You know, the user typed in a negative one because they wanted to stop entering data. Or you reach the end of the file. Then you break out of the loop. Yo, I'm done. I'm going to break out of the loop. What do you use continue for? The user types in bad data. You warn them that they typed in bad data. You ask for some new data and then you hit continue and it goes back up to the top and it keeps running so that you don't have to worry about writing a whole bunch of if statements underneath that say if, no, if not bad data. I agree. Oh, I better stop it. The fastest way of adding syntax to your errors to your code, if you want to do that, is to start putting semicolons where they don't belong. And I know in Python we always had to put something before we started tabbing. So putting a semicolon there seems like the most natural thing in the world. But that doesn't work. What it does is it would go into an infinite loop. Because what this really means is while C is less than 120, do nothing. So nothing ever changes C, so that's an infinite loop. So the short rule of thumb is never put a semicolon after a while or an if or a for. And then, of course, we had to point out that there's a, that doesn't always work as a rule because if you have a do while, then sure enough, we have a semicolon at the end of it. Sorry about that, but the real rule of thumb is you never put a semicolon before an open curly brace. If I put a semicolon there, it breaks it. If I find a while loop and put a semicolon there, it breaks it. So just make sure if your code is behaving really weirdly and not doing your loop correctly or if, if the stuff inside the loop is not compiling, take, make sure that there's no semicolon before the open curly brace. Make sure I got them all. Yeah. If I put a semicolon here, I would get syntax errors. It would say, yo, you can't continue there. And you can't break. And the reason why is because it's treating it like this. Four values equals zero, value is 10, value plus plus. It's going to do this empty body 10 times or 11 times in a row. And then it's done. And now it comes down here and we're not inside a loop anymore. So we can't continue or we can't break. So certainly never after an if, never after a four, never if on a while if it's a while loop rather than a do, do loop. Just in general, anytime you have a curly brace, never the line above it should not have a semicolon. And if you tabbed out your braces like this, like some people do, it becomes real obvious. Don't put a semicolon there. That doesn't make any sense. So there is some advantage to putting the brace on the same line 
is a line above it, right? Here's my while loop. If I put that there, then if I put that there, it looks goofy. So, some people prefer to put the opening brace on the same line as the uh, loop header or the if header. I don't particularly li I like the way this looks a lot better. But you see it a lot, you know. A great many professional programmers do it one way, a great many do it the other. Compound assignment just means, and we had this in Python, if you do int, you know, n for whatever reason equals 1, and then if you do int or n plus equals 1, that changes it to 2 n times equals 3, well, it's going to multiply whatever n was at this point, which is 2, times 3, and so n now equals 6, because it equaled 2 here. n equals 2. And then if we do another one, n plus equals 2, semicolon, this is the same thing as saying n equals n plus 2. Just like when we write n plus plus, that's the same thing as writing n equals n plus 1. So these are known as compound operators because they do some math and then they assign it back into the variable on the left hand side. And you can do addition, multiplication, division, subtraction, and modulus all the same way. All right, so here is our homework based on what we have learned so far. I better copy and paste that into our actual code here. You're kind of wishing that I would just type it so that you could follow along with me. I could do that. So we're going to write a program that counts from 1 to 100 in increments of 5, and I don't care if you use while or for. So that's part of our homework. write code that will count from, now what did I say my limits were? 1 to 100 in increments of 5? I'm going to make it 5 to 100 because I don't want to do 1, 6, 11, right, that's kind of silly. How about 5, 10, 15, 20? So write code that will count from 5 to 100 skipping by 5's. In other words, x plus equals 5, something like that, right? adding 5 to x each time, adding 5 to your loop control variable each time. Use either while or for, or if you feel like doing do, I don't care. So that's the first part. Second part. Count backwards from 100 to 10 in increments of negative 10. So that's part A. Part B, write code that will count backwards from 100 to 10 by increments of negative 10. So use x minus equal 10 or whatever, right? Subtract 10 from your root control variable. And then lastly, the slightly more complicated one, but it's not that bad, is write a program that will ask the user for x, the beginning value, The initial value, initial counter variable value, y, the ending counter value, and z, the increment, the step, 
then print all the numbers from x to y incrementing by z. So here's how that part should look. What is x, the starting point? And they type in 10. What is y, the ending point? And they type in 20. What is z, question mark, the increment? And they type in 2. Now don't space it out like that, right? It's just so that it makes it easier to see. And then it would count from 10 to 20 by 2s. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. And then it's done. So that's an example. An example of how it might work. Does that make sense? All right. It gets sneaky and tricky if you try to make it work and count down. The starting point is 20, the end point is 10, and increment by negative 2. It's harder than you would think. Feel free to try that. See if you can get it to do that. I'd give you extra credit if you did that. But don't get stuck on it, right? You also have other things to do with your in your life. If you can make part C support counting down as well as counting up, extra credit. All right, you're pretty much done with the loop chapter. Talked about do loops, we're on the summary. Yeah, the for loop is common for when the iteration is already known or can be calculated prior to execution. In other words, you're just counting through some data. Infinite loops are caused when the loop's expression never becomes false, right? If x is less than or equal to 10, but x never becomes larger than 10, it'll loop infinitely. You don't have to do the braces if there's only one line of code inside them. I could come up here and find a loop that only had one line of code, like that one, and I could take the braces off, and it would work just as well. I like seeing them, so I put them there. I don't demonstrate leaving them off, but you can do that if you want. The break statement terminates the loop's execution immediately. The continue statement passes over all the remaining statements and continues to the top iteration of the loop. And you can use the system function to call operating system commands, such as the Unix clear command. Well, I don't think we have a clear command, but we have been using pause. If clear worked, it would wipe the screen out, make the screen blank, right? Which might be nice. But we don't have it available under Windows, so we've been leaving it out. I think if we type in CLS, it'd do the same thing. Hey, let's do that. I'm going to take it back out. But after we print out like half of these numbers, after we do the while loop, I'm going to do a system, parentheses, quote, CLS, which stands for clear screen and DOS for Mac and Linux. You use clear. Now when it runs, after it prints those files, it's going to clear the screen. Or it's going to do nothing. Have I added an error to it? Problem. Oh boy. Way up at the top. you got to be kidding me. What have I done wrong? I probably uh, commented out the final brace. That's, that, that's the case. So I need to put in the final star slash in front of my stuff at the bottom. Sorry about that. That was not an intentional error. Okay, that's the end of the homework. Star slash. Run it again. And we'll see that after it prints some stuff, it'll clear the screen. Boom, and then all we see is the four statements. So yeah, you can use the system command to make calls to the operating system, like to clear the screen or to print, press any key to continue. I'm going to delete that though, or at least comment it out, because that'll just be confusing. We are done. Let's create a Dropbox for this. What homework assignment is that? This is homework assignment. Pardon me. This is K, and that little bit of homework will be in.
homework seven.